Good evening. Uh, I'm Chris Cook. I'm the contributing editor here at Tortoise. And welcome this evening uh, to a think on how we save the high street. Um, I should thank in particular uh, our friends at the social investment business, which is a, it's a charity, a generation charity we've been working with for the last year to produce the Corona Shock uh, tracker. Um, the, um, uh, and I'm really indebted to their help the whole of this year, but particularly for this evening. Um, the point of a thinking, if you've not been to one before, is it's supposed to be a little bit like a, um, an editorial meeting at a newspaper, which is to say, we're trying to work out the things that we all agree on, the things we know, the things we don't know. And um, the idea is to come up with, if you like, a sort of shopping list of things that we should be thinking about at the end. So to that end, to avoid it turning into question time in particular, um, we have an informally, uh, well, loosely enforced rule, which is that no one should ask any questions. Um, the, uh, we won't enforce it too heavily, um, but we want people's contributions and comments. Also, I point you to the chat where my colleague Patricia is, is in the chat. I should also thank you as well. I used to work in television, and we're always very, very aware if you work in television of what's on the other channels. And I note there may be some things that are keeping some of our regular members busy, but uh, this really is the elite um, of the Tortoise membership this evening. Um, the, to help us talk through all of this stuff, we have um, Hazel Blears. Hazel's the, the chair of the, of the social investment business, among other things, also a former Secretary of State uh, for communities, and someone who's doing, basically, as far as I can work out, running most of Cumbria in her part in her, <laughs> in her spare time. We also have um, Sally Ann Watkins. Sally um, Ann runs Home Baked, which is a bakery and uh, business in Liverpool. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing basically a proper account from the ground about how things are at the moment. Um, we've also got uh, David Floyd, who runs the community newspapers in North and East London. And uh, David's got a lot of experience of dealing with lots of the, the interminable and Byzantine schemes that currently exist to help save the aforementioned High Street. Um, the, before we go to any of them, I'm actually just going to ask my colleagues to replay the slides that we had at the beginning. Now, these all say source tortoise. They should really say source tortoise slash SIB because we did the maths on this using, um, using data that the SIB basically supplied us with. The big thing this, this shows, this is weekly spending basically over the last year. And you can see that big cliff edge at the beginning at the very left, that's the first lockdown when weekly spending basically collapsed by a third overnight. This is spending running through tills and businesses in England and Wales. And you can see all those little peaks. That's because it's weekly data. And those little peaks are the first week in every month. So that's the first week after most people's payday. So those little Mr. Whippy, peaks, those are the beginnings of the month. And the really big surges, like you can see the one in December, those are unlockings. So you can see how basically, mechanically, from March, from that first lockdown, as we slowly unlocked through the summer, things got a bit better and better and better. Then they, were, they got a bit worse when we locked down again in November. They got much better in December. Then we locked down again in January and things cratered through again. The high street has had a real hammering uh, over the last year. If we go on to the next slide, what you can see is that these are actually the, the, the cumulative effect uh, of um, over the last 49 weeks for uh, basically every town in England and, uh, and Wales, but only looking at grocery, shopping at non-grocery shops. And the big thing to note is everybody, everybody is down. Every town has lost, unless you're one of that very small number at the top in the green who've seen rises in spending, and the reason that they've seen rises in spending on non-grocery items is because they've all got online businesses. That's not a real effect. The real, how, the real um, uh, how to put this, the real high street effect, if you like, is the, is the reality of the bottom of the graph, which is, which is a, big, a big decline. If we go to the next graph. So this is really, really regionally different. Over the last year, even including grocery spending, total spending in Peterborough is down by a third. It's worth thinking about that. That is basically the size of the lockdown for the whole of the UK in the first two weeks. In Peterborough, it more or less continued for the whole of the rest of the year, right? They had an enormous, an enormous um, and horrific lockdown. Oxford is quite typical of university towns. They've had really horrific declines. They've not just lost students, they've also lost tourists. And also Penzance, 
so the, the pure tourist towns are quite inter interesting because actually they were able to run a long, a long season last year. So some of them made up the differences. So they're not quite as badly hit as we first thought they would be last year. If we move on to the next slide, one of the really big things, is, as we pointed out earlier, is the switch to online. So Hoxton is the home, Hoxton East Shoreditch, strictly, is the home of Amazon and other e-tailers. The West End is the home of St. James's, Oxford Street, uh, Oxford Circus, Regent Street. And you can see, basically, the West End has been below par for the whole of the last year, unsurprisingly. That's also where Tortoise's offices are, by the way. And you can see I'm not at Tortoise's offices still. The uh, Hoxton, by contrast, is at one point was accounting for 6% of all spending in England and Wales. There's one ward uh, in uh, central East London. Um, and then the next slide, you can see that one of the effects here is there's quite big effect on retail. And the numbers involved, potentially, if we, uh, over the next, um, over the last year, in terms of stores failing, these are out, these are unusually high numbers. It is not it's not been a benign event at all. The, the support measures haven't kept the high street uh, unharmed. I think that's that's our lot, isn't it? So I just wonder, wonder if I could start with Hazel, uh, because one of the things that, that sparked this thinking, Hazel, was you wrote an op-ed for us in which you basically set out, we can't just pile money in as things were before. Um, we can't just, uh, you know, just keep trying the same thing again and again. So what, and I should also remind people, you're not associated, I think it's fair to say, with the left of the Labour Party. You know, your, your political past does not have, I don't think of you as a natural nationalizer. I think that, that's a fair comment. It's absolutely a fair comment. I think I've always been associated with um, a different way of doing business, social enterprises. I was on the board of the co-op group for six years, uh, mutuals, you know, worker owned enterprises. It's much more exciting than traditional capitalism. And Chris, now everybody's talking about a new stakeholder model for capitalism. So, you know, those of us who have kept the faith for social enterprise and community business, we might even see it in our lifetime. Okay, so so what do you think the what do you think we should be looking for from here? Well, uh, you know, never waste a good crisis. Basically, um, sometimes you know we're, we're all lazy, both in politics and in business, and we just carry on doing the same old thing. Uh, we have undoubtedly now got a crisis in our economy, um, and and in real terms, that means people's jobs, livelihoods, families being affected. So I think this crisis can drive change. I mean, it's a really serious point. But I think that we need some practical ideas about what that looks like. I think the trackers that we've done on high street spend are a really good measure of the general health of the economy. So we've got some data, we've got some figures, we've got some numbers that, again, really helps to drive change. Um, but we actually need some new ways of doing business. And at the moment, you know, lots and lots of small and medium sized um, companies are going to hit the wall um, and go bust because they're just not able to get access to equity finance. Um, really interestingly, equity finance is totally biased towards London. Um, I think those figures we saw on Hoxton and, and um, the West End, all of that, it's very difficult in the regions of this country uh, to try and find finance. But government has got to also realise that if they let all these companies simply go to the wall, then it is usually um, taxpayers and the public money that has to pick up the cost of failure, whether that's in unemployment pay, in the fact that economies decline, the opportunities are not there for the next generation coming up. So this isn't a matter of the government doing nice things and bailing people out. The government, if they're, they're, they think about it carefully, um, you know, they ought to be funding new models of business that make massive impact, which is why social investment business is involved in all of this. Community owned businesses make massive impact. And Sally Ann will be telling you about, you know, what's happening in Liverpool. Perfect illustration. So we've got to be more imaginative, more creative, use public money wisely and well uh, to drive the recreation of the economy. Um, and so at CIB, we've organised two previous roundtables where we looked at feasibility of setting up a fund that could help us make this happen. We looked at the demand um, that there was in, in the community and in the economy. Um, and now we're, we're looking at what kind of models um, there might be if we could get a government backed fund to be able to tackle some of these problems that are going to emerge over the next 
um, few years. It's not going away, this. Somebody said to me, it's like an economic long COVID. Um, and I don't want to learn to live with economic failure. So it's really about being creative. Something like quarter of a million um, small, medium sized businesses could go to the wall if we don't do anything um, about this happening. And I would like to see us do two things. Um, be able to set up a fund that swaps debt for equity, um, allows companies to carry on employing people, but then drives the change into community owned businesses, social enterprises, those that make impact. You know, I think it's, a, it's, it's kind of almost a once in a lifetime opportunity um, to use a terrible disaster actually to drive good. And, and I think, you know, if there's enough people out there who've got a bit of imagination, government's got a lot of money, um, why don't we just give this a go, work out some models. We worked out um, something called a patient equity model um, that, that might be able to allow us to do this. Um, and then, you know, we also looked at um, a government backed employee ownership trust where um, you could swap your uh, a minority share in the business um, to the employees and also involve them in governance. And then we looked at an employee ownership light model where you wouldn't get quite as big a stake and you wouldn't have quite as big a say, but it could be like the first step to a business which otherwise will fail, um, actually going into partnership with its own workforce to do that shared ownership model. I think it's really exciting. I think it's practical. And when things are in the disastrous state they are now, then why not try and innovate and do something new? Can, can I ask just to just to sort of spell out those stats? I should point out, I think it's 2 0, by the way, in the. All right. Um, for, for Action replay is always better. <laughs> <laughs> um, the. the, um, the um, I think the can you just spell out or like if you like with a worked example so let's let's imagine a a pub say they're a sort of uh, they've borrowed a load of money over the last year to survive to attack perhaps um, one of the community uh, one of the the coronavirus loan schemes from the government um, they are in debt to the government uh, on these sort of fairly favorable terms but it's still you know debt to the government so the idea would be that effectively we would say to this business you probably you may not be a going concern if you continue if you try and treat this debt as conventional debt but why don't we take a stock we take a share in you effectively sort of nationalize you in a, in a sense and then flip you into some new model of ownership is that the sort of is that a reasonable summary of what you're thinking about yeah yeah i think it is um but it but it isn't kind of you know your traditional bailout um you know we'll give you the money and um you might limp on in, in the way that you are now and you, you might eventually go bust but it, you know we'll help you go bust on a longer time scale and right. um, that's not the idea the idea is that you change the way that you do business in the longer term um, so that you can become a thriving sustainable um, economic entity a thriving sustainable business that, that can employ people pay them decent wages produce great products um, and, and that is, is the real prize here. So, you know, government has a bit of a checkered history on bailing out organisations. They're not very good at picking winners. Um, and so therefore having intermediaries in the system, like social investors, like social investment business, big society capital, you know, we've got a lot of experience now about long-term patient investing in organizations where you don't get a return straight away, but actually you also make significant impacts because you've got this new business model. You know, if, if you've got a, a worker's share in an enterprise, um, there is now very good evidence that you get higher productivity, higher commitment, you know, less people off sick, better um, uh, engagement with the business. So you, you're changing and making yourselves more efficient um, at the same time as getting some financial support. I, I do think that government have got to explore other models because just a bailout is not, it won't last, you know, it might last, I don't know, five years. After that, if you haven't changed something significant, you'll be back where you started. Thanks ever so much, Hazel. I was wondering if we could come to David next, actually, just to, um, just to talk, actually, just to explain a little bit about if what the sort of conventional processes are at the moment. So if you're not, if you're a, if you're a sort of fairly normal retailer on the high street, the support you've had at the moment 
can we just talk about that sort of idea of unsustainability and, and what the and what the issues are sort of going forwards? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that the levels of support that businesses have, have had, you know, from the government during COVID, you know, varies greatly. I mean, depending on how how businesses are are set up, uh, and you know, um, you know you know what their what their um what their ownership model is and, 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 and you know, whether they're whether they're sole traders or whether they're registered companies and 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 you know i mean a, a lot of the challenge of of the past 18 months is there's, there's been a huge amount of money sloshing around the government has tipped loads of money into the economy but the way that it's worked itself through the economy is has been quite random <laughs> you know it, 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 essentially that you know if, in, in some cases businesses that are you know you know, relatively small will will suddenly have received grant funding, which you know equals to quite a, you know fifty percent or so of their turnover. You know, through 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 the random money that's dished out, other people because of the way that they're set up may have may have received nothing at all. So it it it, it, it it's varied it's varied a great deal. I mean, I I I I I, th- I think one of the the biggest challenges in terms of how things restart, particularly in terms of the high street, is going to be. What happens about business rates, which have, which have been you know, either you know, removed or reduced for a large number of businesses um, over the course of uh, over the course of the the lockdown, the various lockdowns, and and business rates have also been the the sort of administrative vehicle through which a lot of businesses have have, have received subsidies. I mean, that's a real challenge in the sense that the business rate system is, is hugely punitive towards um, retail uh, businesses compared to other types of business. Currently, the, you know, if, 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 you know, if people want to know why a lot of shops and high street are failing, your part of it is that the, the, the taxes they face are huge compared to other ways, other ways of doing business. So, so, so the state is actively, you know, going against retail as a way of operating through the tax system currently and that's something that you know if the government has a desire to enable high streets to to restart effectively uh, post covid it, it really needs to, it really needs to address that business rates are kind of in a situation where either they're extremely punitive and go against businesses trying to operate or they um, they are so high for particular kinds of activity that they can't be paid and have to be written off entirely in discretionary discretionary measures. So, 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 so there kind of isn't any sustainable model for business rates coming in, and that that's a big issue for 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 businesses. But but I I, I think in a broad sense it really is there's, there's a massive mixture of, of of different situations that that that, that businesses have, have been facing. It is that combination of of randomness and uncertainty that's really been a, a major problem. Can I ask about debt in particular as well? Because I think the one of the things that I'm one of the things that in a sense the the opportunity that Hazel sort of sees in the crisis I think rests on the idea that that there's a lot of there's just a lot of debt out there now. That the that, I mean, just wondering whether you you sort of run into that. Well, I, I mean, the, 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 there's certainly been an opportunity through the through the bounce back loan scheme and the related loan schemes for for businesses to take on a lot of debt. You know, that, that's that, that's the money that's been most easily available to mm-hmm. to a lot of businesses. You know, at, you know, at a very high level relative to the to the turnover of 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 the business. Um, so, so in, in in that instance, you know, there will have been a massive temptation for a lot of businesses to to, to take on debts because they had you know no other choice in order to keep going when when lockdown hit. And obviously, there, there will now be the question, you know, when when that money starts to be repaid, and you know, you know we actually ourselves as as social spider as a uh, independent news publisher we are a recipient of a of a bounce back loan which we have we've started to repay the first repayment has gone out um this month and as as those repayments start obviously for 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 some businesses who've taken on debt which is uh, you know very high in proportion to the size of their business they'll suddenly be be saying oh there's this chunk of money going out every month but the income may not yet have come back to to cover the cost of repaying that, and and that for, for some businesses is going to be a challenge. I mean, the, the clearly is there are measures within the the loans framework for 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 the, for those debts to be you know for that can to be kicked along the road if you, if, if you like. You, the, 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 there are sort of mitigatory measures in place, but ultimately, 
that debt is gonna is gonna be on your balance sheet one way or another, and that definitely will have have impact in terms of what businesses can do. Thanks, David. I wonder if we could come to Sally Ann because Sally Ann, you you hold so you you run uh, Home Baked, so a, a bakery pie shop in a business, I should say, in in uh, in Liverpool. But you're a social entity. You're 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 not structured like a normal business. No, so um, I'm, I'm the chair of Home Baked Bakery, which is a community owned cooperative. It is literally opposite the, um, the COP. We've been trading since 2013. We bake fresh bread daily and we make pies. And we're on, if anybody's ever been to Anfield, we're, we're in an area that was subjected to housing market renewal where the population was moved out. The houses were tinned up. Um, the high street, the local high street, is basically fast food outlets and pubs serving the football ground. Right. When Home Bake started its journey, we were told that we'd never make it work, we'd never make it happen in, in, in that community. Um, we're a half a million pound turnover business, employing 20 people, 80% of whom live within walking distance of the bakery. Um, of that £500,000 turnover, including nearly £100,000 from the American owners of the football club, um, is all spent with local suppliers. So in practice, we've been revigorating the high street with a different, with a different model, which keeps the money in the local economy, keeps the presence in the local, local economy, and delivers the social value that Hazel was Hazel was talking about. And we've proved that actually we've had a really successful pandemic. I know it sounds stupid, but we have because we're rooted in in the community, owned by the community, led by the community. We've been able to react and respond to the needs. So within a week of the lockdown, we were baking 100 loaves a day and sending them to the local food banks. We've delivered a, an online pie service. We've, we've basically pivoted numerous times and at the same time have sustained our community by providing fresh bread, etc. But as part of my role at Home Baked, I've been a judge on the Great British High Street, and this isn't a new problem. This is this is a very old problem that the pandemic has just accelerated the decline of, of the of, of the high street. And I was lucky enough to go to Crickowl, which won the Great British High Street a couple of years ago. And some of the learnings from there that have resonate with what I've seen at Home Bakes and I've seen in other places. Ownership of the high street is, is, is a massive thing. Ownership of buildings that are, that are owned um, by offshore, by absentee landlords that are owned because they're propping up somebody's balance sheet rather than they're actually a revenue generator is, is a massive issue for high streets everywhere. It's an issue in Anfield, which is, a, you know, a small deprived area. So you escalate that up into, into more affluent areas and that becomes a major issue. So something to crack the ownership is a major issue. The other thing about Crickal was it was small businesses, family owned, and people lived above the shops. So it was a live work mixed model. It wasn't just retail. It was eating. It was pubs. It was bookshops. It was green grocers. It was um, community hubs. That that sort of thing. So so that high good high streets are a mix of different types of businesses that isn't just reliant on on retail. And those of us that are a bit older will remember older high streets that were made up of family owned businesses and the library was on the high street and there were things for that you know family restaurants all of that sort of thing um what we're trying to do at home bake now is take on a derelict block of buildings to the left of us directly opposite Anfield and we will have a pie production unit a market garden a community shop um, and a makers space small business hub because actually that mixed use is the way 
is the way forward. But the challenges are always finance. It's always say, how to get someone to invest. It's at practically impossible if you have no assets. So Sally Ann, can we just go back one step actually on, on the on the thought there? So the so home baked is so so it's a cooperative. So yeah. it's so the so the owner is a group of members or yeah. workers? Group of members. It's a it's a community um, cooperative. Okay. And so the so if you're a, if you lived in Anfield, or maybe if you don't, maybe you can live anywhere. But if you lived in Anfield, you can sign up to become a member. You do you pay a sub, or is it just a notional membership of a? It's a notional membership of a pound, and it's okay. for anybody who lives, works, or plays in Anfield. Okay. And there's some very big employers in Anfield: the football club, the schools, the health centres. That is as much a part of the community as the people who live there. And our worldwide football supporter regulars um, are as much a part of the home bake community and the home bake family as people who live in the area. And it was our AGM earlier uh, this year. And we had members join us because it was virtual from America and from other places in, 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 in Europe. So as a model, being a cooperative works really well in um the community owning and engaging in what you're doing so the, so you make your so if you like your day-to-day -day costs you you know you meet by selling your products yes and then, and then raising but raise, so raising capital so to get the money to build get this new building to set up the premises that's the challenge and how so how do you do it now is it just donations or basically or so our model is is based on the football club so we differentially price. So our prices and our fresh bread are affordable to the community. And then on a match day, when people can afford to buy a season ticket to Anfield, they can afford to pay 50% um, more for their pie. So the money from the matches cross subsidise is what we do in the local community from a training perspective. Um, and we're a, before the pandemic, we were a 90% traded business. So when we have received grants, we haven't talked about it as grant. We talk about it as investment. I think that's the language is really important. You know, big car factories don't say they've had grants. Big car factories say they've had investment to create jobs. We've had investment that's enabled us to buy equipment, etc. But to make the next step, to take on the building to our left, we've got no assets, we've got no buildings. Right. So to actually acquire the building is, is, is a really interesting challenge. And um, I've spent a lot of time going around trying to find out a way of doing that. And that's relatively easy. Try doing that with an overseas landlord, it's impossible. Right, can, I, can we come to Robert Campbell, who's been patiently waiting for us? So the, I think just to, to summarise there also the, the thought on Sally Ann raises there is the, when Hazel was talking about the need for a, for a fund, you can see why just you know, it's quite helpful for seeing why you need the fund, because if you can't sell equity, and you don't have assets to borrow against, then how do you get the ball rolling on these things? Um, but Robert, you said you've got a plan. I think the plan. Well, yeah. OK, so disclosure, I've got um, I've got a small startup company using cargo bikes for delivering zero emissions delivery within the city of Newcastle upon Tyne. We've been operating for just about two years now. I think that uh, as um, the previous speaker was talking about, that this is a problem of the high street, which has been around for a long time. And we continue to do the same things, um, but slightly differently. I think what we've got now is an opportunity with the pandemic, changing the nature of work, working from home, um, schooling from locally to actually provide ourselves with a local community focus. I was really encouraged by what's going on in Anfield. Um, I used to own a house there eight <laughs> years ago, but um, really encouraged with that. We've been doing something similar up in the Northeast. Um, there's a, a collective organization called Food and Drink Northeast, um, which is taking local artisan producers and trying to provide community markets or um, a market focus. And there's a number of these things springing up in local um, areas within Newcastle. 
I think the time has come to join a number of problems up into one, to provide livable spaces within the high street. Um, I certainly believe that living, walking, cycling, active travel brings and has proven on many occasions in many cities um, to bring a great increase in retail footfall. Um, the last TFL report that I read was talking about increases in retail footfall of about nine or 10%. Um, these things bring together a community focus in a livable way. And um, I think if we can combine that with some of the community ownership that we were talking about um, just a few minutes ago, I think we can make a real difference. And I think we can also, rather than exclude the big retailers or the big home delivery requirement that um, people like Amazon and other online retailers and see those as an enemy, there seems to me to be an opportunity to bring a partnership about delivery for those organizations. Um, there's a need to change the way in which we deliver into city and urban areas, as well as rural, but certainly from in urban areas, to address the air quality issues that we have um, as a significant problem in, this, in the, this country. Newcastle is one of the dirtiest cities in terms of air quality outside of London. But if we can actually change the nature of delivery, change the nature to um, micro distribution hubs, working with the local community, working with local delivery partners like ourselves and others, um, and change the center of operation so that people like Amazon and others see not as uh, being seen as complete competition with local retailers, but actually as partners um, to where local retailers do those things that the bigger um, retailers and bigger online retailers don't do. So that they, they, they kind of work in harmony with one another a lot more than they currently do. Thanks ever so much. I think I'm, I'm gonna pick up some of the thoughts, the points you raised there with, with some people in a moment. But can we come to now to Daniel Dipper? Because uh, Daniel, you raise a you raise a sort of a, a slightly um, provocative question about whether whether the saving the high street is the right question, really. Yeah, so I mean, kind of one I looked at this. The other question that came to my head was actually, should we be saving the high street? I mean, there's been some very interesting thoughts this evening. Actually, it's good to hear about these successes um, because maybe you know maybe I'd adjust my view based on that. But kind of when I was looking at it initially, it was like, is the high street really a model? That is going to work into the future because i mean you know amazon online retailers are just so much more efficient and actually have much lower costs as well for smaller businesses so i suppose my question was kind of what is the, the role of the high street i mean i've heard some suggestions about the high street becoming more of an experience um so possibly that's a way forward and more kind of a service provision almost but i mean um I have to admit, though, I do have a bias in that uh, shopping isn't my favourite activity, to be honest. So uh, I much prefer online myself because I just I just get tired and fed up of walking around after a few hours. OK, thanks. I should say happy birthday to you, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was last <laughs> week. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, uh, Hazel, can I come back to you on that? Because I guess because I mean, the, the, the purpose of the social investment business, I guess, is because you fundamentally believe that um, you know, part of your your mission is that you you fundamentally believe that High Street isn't just a shopping place. Oh, are you still you're still muted, I think. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're now. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, for for social investment business, um, our kind of founding principle is providing patient capital to organisations um, in communities, which can deliver great services and businesses, um, but also make impact. Um, so we've kind of concentrated on community, voluntary sector, co-ops, all of those kind of organisations. Um, but I'm quite interested in people's comments that this doesn't just have to be about the high street. You know, the, the, the small businesses that are likely to go bust employ a lot of people. And if they do go bust, then the whole community then is the poorer. And then you get into that kind of slide down, downhill. Um, which then is very much harder to, to kind of reverse uh, once you've allowed it to happen. So I, I, I don't think this is an exclusively high street um, 
conversation. Um, it is it is at the moment because we've got all this fantastic data through the trackers, working with Tortoise, all of that. But the principles that we're trying to establish would apply across business. And that's why I talk about, you know, a different kind of capitalism, a, you know, a, a, a broader definition that's not just about maximizing profit to shareholders, but also has a responsibility to the communities where they operate, the colleagues they employ and the customers they serve. Now, that is a very live debate, even in this government, talking about changing Section 172 of the Companies Act to have that new definition of business. And once you start to do that, you start to challenge the very kind of foundations um, of traditional commercial exploitative business. And you start to look more at businesses like Sally Ann's that actually is a huge part of the community, of the fabric, um, you know, it, it's the glue that holds that community together. And I expect it does brilliant pies as well. Um, but I, I think this is part of a bigger and wider debate about changing the nature of business. Thanks, thanks ever so much. Uh, I was wondering if we could come back actually just now, I'm gonna, Put my colleagues on the spot. If we come back to David Floyd, um, jumping around without, I'm not supposed to jump around without telling them, um, but I am. Uh, <laughs> um, good, David, so you're one of the things that, one of the things I'm really sort of keen to sort of get, to sort of get my head around today is really around, the, around these sort of other models. And so you're, I mean, I'm particularly interested in your model because you're doing journalism with, mm. uh, but not not owned by a plutocrat or uh, no, no. so can you just tell me about how, again so because one of the things I think is that the issues that Sally Ann raises one of the issues that Hazel raises and um, is this sort of is the issue of the um, of the you know the capital question right so Hazel mm. talks about the need for a fund and maybe they maybe effectively the capital we've already put into businesses could effectively become that fund retroactively if businesses can be flipped from um, holding debt to being basically nationalised. But um, can you just talk me about talk me through about your experience of running quite complicated businesses without without shareholders? Yeah. So 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 we as um, Social Spider we're a we're a community interest company limited by guarantee. So we're a not for profit uh, company structure, and um, we are we are publishers of of five. Uh, uh, local newspapers in different bits of northeast and central London, with a combined uh, circulation of, of sixty thousand, readership of over two hundred thousand, and yeah, I, I mean, I mean um, our, our business has come about you know, in terms of as a social enterprise because the corporate model of local news is failed and failing, and you know. London may be slightly different to, to other areas of the country in the way that corporate local news is failing, but it's failing in different ways in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, 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 in London, corporate local news publishers don't have any, any locally based journalists. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the local paper in, in Waltham Forest, where, where, where we started our, our, our first um, social enterprise local newspaper the, the corporate newspaper in that area has has no one based in Waltham Forest and is is edited from from Watford uh, so, so 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 corporate local news has basically been scaling down their production in a, in a model of managed decline to, to the point where their their advertising numbers just about add up but they're delivering no public interest news value in in uh, in in in, res in respect of the the money they're taking out of the the market in in, in advertising income so we're looking to a di different model of that which places news first and works with people in the local community to produce news so we bring together professional journalists who are editors and they work with um, people and uh, community groups in the local area who make voluntary contributions to the publications, then we distribute mass circulation free newspapers in our local area. And the challenge for, for that from a finance point of view is that low, is that news publications have quite big startup costs before you get to the point of generating advertising income. And if that, if those startup costs for your publications are not coming from, from as you say, from plutocrats or, 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 or other wealthy individuals, it's very difficult to find, find that startup income that you need. We've been able to do that through slightly unusual and difficult to replicate ways in the sense that as a social enterprise, we have other activities in terms of research and consultancy work, which has enabled us to, to cross subsidize um, our work in local news. For anyone else starting a local news publication in their local area, there's, there's a viable model there. 
I mean, in many areas, there is still enough advertising income, print advertising income available to do a half decent local news publication if you're focused on news rather than extracting profits to send them to your US-based shareholders. The problem is that getting to the point of, of doing that local news publication, which you know could be sustainable, but it's not going to generate massive profits, getting to that point is, is very difficult if you don't have a way of, you know, of getting started in the first place, you're going to need to spend tens of thousands to get to the point of you know, being able to break even through a through a commercial model. So, so, so that's that's a real that's a real challenge for 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 you know, local news publications. I think um, th th there's an additional factor as well that the biggest single chunk of subsidy going into local news is public notices you know, issued by councils, and, and there's you know, certainly in the region of 70 million or so a year from local councils in public notice advertising going into local newspapers. And that is almost exclusively goes to the corporates, corporate local news groups to cross subsidize their failing model rather than going to, to independent local news publications and changes on that could make a massive difference. Well, that's a, yeah, there's a, that's a really good thought actually. Could, could, we, could we go to Rich Collins? who's another enthusiast for, um, Another enthusiast for social social finance, and uh, could you? I just wonder if you you um, you have thoughts on what this fund that so we we've sort of we've I think we've kind of established repeatedly that we need a you know there needs to be a a seed stock of cash basically to make this work. Can you just talk me through what you think that looks like if it works? Yeah, yeah I guess. For, there's there's already quite a bit of cash out there, uh, and we and we know that. But what we've seen uh, recently is a lot of organisations becoming much more. This is social organisations much becoming much more grant dependent over over the over the period of the COVID pandemic, um, as as money ran out. Uh, so they were turning to grants. The grants became available, and people who were moving towards trading models have gone rushing back to being grant reliant. And um, for those of us who work in the sector, we've been trying desperately to move that the other way. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, a, a, a considerable move backwards. Now we've got an opportunity to start thinking about how we fund people in a different way and how we move organisations forward. Um, we've had, seen some really great examples, and David's just given a really good one there using, using the media as, as, a, as a way of, of doing it. Uh, and Sally Ann's one about the bakery, absolutely fantastic models, but it's quite rare to find organisations that are able to generate and access this funding. And, and Hazel's point right at the beginning about being able to create a pot of cash and finding somewhere from the government, if essential, it would be essential way of getting it out there to, to, to people. However, that money needs to be really, really accessible. And a lot of the organisations out there that we class as community organisations, social businesses, are pretty small. And most of the money that's come through so far around social investment has gone to very big organisations. My organisation, we deal with very small, really micro organisations and getting folk in front of investors and getting social investment into organisations has been really difficult mainly because it's not very patient. And, and, and I was really, I was typing a comment just as Hazel mentioned the word patient. I was really happy to hear it uh, because actually we turn, try and turn around and get money paid back in five years. Most organizations can't touch that kind of turnaround, not at the percentage rep repayments that are needed. We need things that are much slower and, and you know, community organizations, they are socially owned. They haven't got any actual equity to give away. So, so we, we need we need we need to, you know, they're not worth anything because they're not for profit. So we need to actually find a way of turning that into taking part of the profits that are generated. It's kind of quasi equity that we talk about. And we're using these buzzwords that don't mean anything. We have to find ways of actually finding, you know, useful terms that people can understand and, and be able to access it. We'd make this whole funding thing really difficult for people. And actually what we need is a pot of money that people can apply for in the same way as they pay for apply for grants that is repayable in a patient way even repayable grants would be great because we can circulate the money back around but keeping interest rates down keeping repayment terms long you know we're talking 10 years plus in some cases to turn even small amounts of money you know under a hundred thousand pounds which is going to change organizations entire structures and keep them sustainable for a very long time actually getting that paid back over a longer time so they can make the difference and change some of the trading models so that they're picking up work from contracts and stuff like that from our local authorities so we are circulating business 
we aren't we aren't setting up organizations in this way at the moment and it's great to hear examples that are coming through and we're talking about changing high streets towards this model i'd like to see new organizations coming through young people led that support their communities that are led by governed by and employ people from within the local communities that are actually supporting that social business that's a so good rich, social economy rich can i ask you so you're a sort of consultant in in this sort of space can i is it, it I mean, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued, but this is incredibly, it's quite nerdy, but um, I'm quite intrigued by the, the like the, almost like the corporate law question here, right? Is, is there like a, if you can't sell equity, you don't have to start with assets. Is there, a, is there like a, is there a problem with the law that, you know, that can be, is there an issue here about the fact that we're trying to sort of wedge these institutions into the wrong legal formula? Or is it just literally there's sort of no way around the fact that you need the way, you need the money from somewhere to get going and you know I mean part of part of the reason I'm asking is because I'm 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 sort of in my head I sort of think of this as maybe we're going to sort of nationalise indebted businesses and then then work out what the form should be afterwards but maybe I've got that wrong in my head. Well, I, th I think, you know, uh, there's, there's people far better than me to uh, to talk about governance of organisations, I can assure you that. But um, if from my point of view, we're looking at it in slightly the wrong way by uh, by talking about, you know, the social economy as being the same as, you know, private uh, businesses. It's completely different. Um, we can run them the same. We can support them the same, but the structures are essentially very, very different. So how you fund them and then as a result uh, is different. Um, what we tend to do is, I think, is base this whole social economy around the, the charity model. And that's actually completely different. So if we've got a charity model on one hand and we've got a community enterprise model on the other side, you can run a, a community interest company in the same way as you can a private business. However, it doesn't always have to be not for profit and some are some aren't my organization is not for profit so we put our money back into what we do in terms of pro bono work or or, or others um some people don't they give a selection of a way what we haven't got is a proper term for what a social enterprise is there is no definition for what that is so you could give away one percent of your money and say i'm a social enterprise uh, or you could give 100 percent away away of your money and you're still a social enterprise we've got a bit of a problem around that but it's, 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 it's doable. It's how we look at those businesses and how they, they work. For me, if you're looking at things from a social perspective, you're looking to, to, to meet the needs of a community through what you're doing, that's a proper good social business. Thanks, Rich. Um, I, I've basically waited for Claire Selby to be on the move before I try and come to her. Uh, but now she's, she's settled. So Claire, um, what, what, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to chat a bit about the project we've done in Kingston. Oh, yeah. So we um, we launched a crowdfunder in February to apply for Mayor of London funding. Um, we were successful. We got £30,000 from the Mayor of London. And then Royal Borough of Kingston actually matched it. We got the keys to the vacant PC world on Fife Road at the end of March. And we opened as a creative meanwhile at the beginning of May. And it nearly killed me and my team. Um, it's a joint project between the student union and then the project I run, which is a creative agency out of Kingston School of Art. But we could, just got the figures for the first month, which are completely insane. We've had three and a half thousand visitors. Uh, the average spend is 22 pounds. Um, the footfall is increased Claire, in the whole street. Can you just go um, back a step, Claire, and just tell me sorry, what, yeah. what, what, do you, what do you do? So basically, um, we sell, exhibit, and encourage students, graduates, and local people to bring in their products and we sell them for them. And the model is the seller gets 80%, we take 20%. They don't have to come and stand in the stall. We sell the products for them, we market them for them, we put them on social media, everything. Um, I can drop the Instagram. The Instagram is just not my beautiful house, Kingston. Um, the students worked on the branding, it wasn't me. Uh, the interior students also did all the refit, product students have built the furniture and the idea is that uh, we have the space until the end of August and then we move on to another space within Kingston and we've already proved that it's a model that works. Um, so I just want to shout about it because <laughs> I need some more press. <laughs> no, that's, that's really exciting. I think the, the, I mean the, and it sort of, it goes to the point, right? So that you, you can go, you can work with a space 
because you're yep. doing something for the community you can work with the space that you can get from the council because you know they trust you're doing it for the right reasons yep you you'll capitalize on relatively small amounts of cash your, your startup needs are very small and the, all of the money stays locally and yep. supports local micro businesses yeah so what rich was saying about young people led I think uh, when we sort of opened it, we thought, oh, the students are all going to run forward with our ideas and want to do workshops and want to do all this. But we didn't realize how much COVID has actually affected them and how right. much the pandemic has drained their confidence. So there's a huge piece of work for all of us to do to, to get their skills up and get them to realize that they're really talented illustrators or um, ceramicists. And so there's a whole there's a whole sort of backstory as well, but it's probably the best thing I've ever done in my entire career because it's so so rewarding seeing students come in and bring their work and then you know telling them a week later all of your prints have gone or all your products have gone. So it's a really nice positive story, I guess, to end the think on in. Oh, there's six minutes left. <laughs> <What's> the, <laughs> Can anyone beat yeah, it? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in charge here. The, um, <laughs> Sorry. The, um, I wonder if we could go to Sally Ann next, actually, um, because I'm so, so you in a, a sense, Sally Ann, you're at the other end of the telescope in terms of that you've been established for a while. You've 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 gone through the startup phase. You're now into the sort of the medium term, and you're looking at expansion. Are there problems that 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 come with the model down the line? With it, how's like is there a sustainability issue? Um. It's always hard work and working capital is always an issue from, from a trading um, business perspective. But the view of these type of businesses take a long time to get up and running. So they really do need patient capital. And the only thing that's kept Homebake going is we've got three member, we've had three member loans where three members of the cooperative lent us 15,000 in total that just sat there helping us from a cash flow perspective until we were able to, to, re, to repay it. And I put in the comment about Kindred. Kindred is um, an initiative in Liverpool City region supported by Power to Change and Steve Rotherham as mayor. And that is looking to invest with patient capital in socially traded organisations. So it's moving away from funding charities, it's funding businesses that trade socially and they can have any form, they can be limited companies or you know, they can be co-ops or they can be CICs, but actually what their benefit is is that they are socially trading, they're trading for the good of their community. And that is patient capital, some of which can be repaid in social um, return on investment. And some of it is repaid when you're ready, and then the money comes back into the into the fund. So and that's just, so, just selling out just on um, on social return. What can you just explain what you mean by that? So social return measures the things that GDP doesn't measure, the things that by keeping people employment, how you impact on health, how you impact on well-being, how your money circulates into employment if you keep your money in in the um in in the local economy and there's all sorts of ways of measuring it um there's a bit of an industry around it i quite like measuring it as a story um but we have been measured by a housing association who we've received a loan from and for every pound invested in home bait they worked out that it returns 20 pounds in social return in opportunity opportunity um reduction in employment benefits reduction benefits to health etc so can, you, I just, can i just unpick just to go even to unpick even further on that thought so it might be that someone will say so that so let's say i'm i'm the i'm elected unexpectedly as I, maybe at the time not local to liverpool's city council i am um, i get i might give you a grant and say um i'll give you Ten thousand pounds, and in return, I want to see. That's probably not enough for this, but um, I want to see. Uh, you don't have to repay it, but I want to see unemployment stay below this level in this local area. I want you to have employed sixty-five people under the age of twenty-five. That kind of thing. Exactly that type of thing that, and that you're spending your money 
in in the local local economy that you're taking volunteers from a cross section of the uh, of the community so there's all sorts of ways of there's all sorts of ways of, of measuring it but actually it's a really good measure of of an investment return that is much better than flipping gdp which counts <laughs> the prostitution in its numbers they, they, well, i mean okay more 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 bakers less prostitutes um the the can i come back to hazel please um because i think there's there's a um i think one of the one of the things i'm sort of struck by is um I, i'm sort of curious whether you've had a bit of a conversion on this or whether this has been a i mean you said earlier you're a long-term co-op person but i mean listening to sally ann it strikes me that there, there was like a conversation 15 years ago about like um, social investment bonds and prisons and trying to do sort of lots of clever huge things but maybe is social is the is the the way to use social investment to hit much smaller entities to set up lots of bakeries and give them please employ people locally yeah um i actually did um the first social enterprise strategy which was cross government and that's probably about 15 years ago now and we actually brought together treasury and business departments and home office. So every department had to send a minister. And we did, we, you know, it, it was a, a moment of great opportunity that was never, unfortunately, fully realized. You made um, a co-op of ministers, Hazel. What did you expect? <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, I've always believed that if you empower ordinary people, they're capable of amazing things. And this conversation this evening has proved exactly that. You know, I, I want to come and have a look at Kingston and all, all kinds of things. But what I think social investment um, gets wrong is it tries to mirror conventional um, investment. And you, you probably have, a, you know, in the early days, you had a lot of bankers involved and bankers, you know, genuinely wanting to do good. Um, but all of their training and all of their models are about a very particular financial way of working and therefore not valuing uh, the social, economic, environmental impact. How do you measure it? The impact on people's well-being, on their quality of life. It was all about return, return in, in monetary terms and monetizing things. And I do think now that there is more of an appetite for being more um, diverse in how we measure success. What does it look like? It's not just if you're a millionaire, it's if you're happy. You know, all that work that um, Professor Layard did on happiness, it sounds la di da but actually today it's never been more relevant. That's why I'm quite excited um, about people's willingness to do something different. When you've had the pandemic, you've got post COVID, the recovery is really fragile, people are gonna be out of work. The, the model of this circular economy, which I think Rich was talking about, um, you know, it, it's coming into its own. So we, we just need a, a movement, if you like, a movement that's powerful, um, that gives people like the ones on this call tonight, um, a much more effective and influential voice. I mean, I, I think there's, a, I think this is, I mean, I, I'm, I start, I'm one of those sort of des terrible desiccated economist type people who, um, who worry about, you know, about um, simple structures and clear, like, uh, rates of return. But actually, the, 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 um, I've, I'm genuinely, genuinely really persuaded, actually, of the, of the, of the possibility. But my, I guess the, the thing I can't get beyond in my head is, it's going to cost a lot of money, right, to make this to make this scale up, or rather, to make the scale up nationally requires a lot of people across the country to all be engaged in this, and you know, it requires more royal boroughs of Kingston and Pont Thames to to is it royal borough? I think the borough of Kingston and Pont Thames to sort of back people like Claire. It requires more businesses like Liverpool Football Club to to help people like Sally Ann. It requires. Um, um basically a, a lot of people across yeah. to make it national it requires it, a sort of a it change, does right? chris it does chris but you know let's get some economics into this let's measure how much we're going to spend on unemployment benefit let's measure how much we're going to spend on people's mental and physical health because they're out of work their community's devastated the high streets are a wreckage area let's start measuring some of the costs of not doing something 
you know, those costs are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and having a more social model for business that helps to address some of those social issues as well as the economic issues. These things are not mutually exclusive. You don't have do-gooders in one corner and um, you know people who are good at business in another corner. You bring that together, you have got a powerful force both for good and for making money. You know, I'm I'm not embarrassed about people wanting to um, get a return and make money, but we can do it in a different way. That's I, I think this is normally exciting. I sh we haven't actually mentioned that the co-op um, has been claiming today. The co-op um, been claiming today that actually the the, the um, that social business that cooperative businesses have been more resilient over the last over the pandemic. Um, there's a I mean if you're if you're run in a patient way and you can sit out and wait for uh, a crisis, um, it's um, you know there are really real advantages to that. Um, I just want, it's, we've now hit our time. We've been talking for so long that England have got through to the next round of the European Championships since we started. <laughs> the, um, um, the, I'm really, I, I'm genuinely really excited by this. This is actually my last ever thinking um, because I'm leaving Tortoise, but the, the um, I'm genuinely really, really excited by the prospect of this. I think that the, the capacity of, institutions that don't think in a sort of classical way for want of a better word is enormously powerful as Sally Ann has shown already in Liverpool as Claire is showing um, in uh, in Kingston um, but what we need is a uh, is um, yeah the patience is the tough thing I guess I mean the yeah. how you build a system that lets people try things without potentially knowing exactly what the outputs are going to be but in the hopes that the outputs might be good, I guess is that it's part of the challenge too. Yep. Um, yes. Are you going somewhere where you can influence mainstream capitalism? I'm, I'm going to the Financial Times as it happens. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but back where back where I started. But um, yeah. But if yeah. you think the woman who was the senior financial correspondent at the Financial Times is now running the Impact Investing Institute, isn't that you know? There it is. Know. That's that. Maybe I'll maybe I'll see you there. Maybe I'll see you there. <laughs> So thanks ever so much for, for everyone. I've, it's been really, really wonderful. Been, I've had a very jolly two years, but it's been a very wonderful, it's a jolly hour. Um, uh, thanks ever so much to all the, the um, uh, for all the commenters. Thank you for particularly Hazel, to Sally Ann, and to David for their, their particular expertise. Thank you to the social investment business for their help us reporting on these issues over the last year without whom None of the Corona shock would have happened. Um, the Corona shock tracker would have happened. Um, and uh, I'll see you as a guest at uh, Future Thinking. Thanks ever so much. Bye.